Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gutter, the prison, or the grave. This time, a platinum wristwatch, a body on a lonely strip of beach, and a case of heart failure in a Beverly Hills garage all added up to blackmail, 25 years old. And a killer who would never be caught. It happened like this. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in... The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. In just a moment, tonight's story. And now we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Anniversary Gift. Turn left at the next corner, Cabby. Okay. Boy, this Beverly Hills in the sunny afternoon is really something, ain't it? Yeah. Wide streets, classy homes. Boy, these jokers got it made. Some life. Nothing ever gets to them to bother them except the income tax, maybe. Yep. Here it is, mister. 8834 Beverly Road. What a joint. Yeah. Um, wait for me, huh? Sure, sure, mister. <laughs> The door was answered by a girl of about 16, a tall, slender girl with dark eyes, too deep for her years. Oh, come in, won't you? I believe Dad's expecting you. She led me across a living room as dignified as the lobby of a bank to a door that she opened. If you'll wait here in the library, I'll tell Dad you've come. The library of Stanley Tarner, my new client, was as somber as his living room, except for one thing. Over a fireplace that half filled one wall was a life-size portrait of a woman. A most beautiful woman. Could have been a painting of what the girl who had just left would look like in another 25 years. I was still staring at the picture when Stanley Tarner came in. That's a portrait of Margaret, my wife. We lost her one week ago today. I'm sorry, Mr. Tarner. Well, we'd been expecting it for over a year. The doctors had warned us, but... Even when you're braced for a blow like that, it... Uh, yes, I know what you mean. It was her heart, Marlowe. She was coming home from a shopping trip in Westwood last Tuesday evening when it happened. She had her own car and was just pulling into the garage here when the attack seized her. Catherine, my daughter, and I both heard her car hit the garage wall. We ran out and found her. The doctor did everything possible. But Wednesday morning, she was, she was dead. I'm, I'm sorry. It's all right, Mr. Tarner. I must tell you all this because the... The reason I called you here has to do with Margaret's death. I don't understand. I... I I've got to get Mar Margaret's watch back. A what? A watch? Yes, a wristwatch. It's, um... Uh, well, I'll try to explain. I loved my wife very deeply, Marlowe. Now that I've lost her, the most important thing in the world to me is the preservation of her memory. Can you understand that? Well, it's natural that you'd cling to things that remind you of her, Mr. Towner. Uh, now, what about the watch? It, it's lost. Somewhere in Camino Beach. You know where that is? Uh, yes, a few miles below Redondo. Yes, that's right. Well, the day Margaret died, I had taken her watch with me to have it repaired. I went down the coast on some business, and on the way back, I stopped at Camino Beach for lunch, a place called the Trade Winds. You had the watch with you when you went in? Yes, in my overcoat pocket. I came out and got in my car and was halfway back to my office before I realized it was gone. I, I've i got to get it back, Marlowe. How much is it worth? In cash, about $500, but to me, now, it's it's worth 20 times that. Uh, what's the watch like? It's a Benarus, platinum, and set with emeralds. Mm -hmm. I gave it to Margaret on our 20th wedding anniversary. There's an inscription on the back to Margaret from Stanley with eternal love. I know that watch is somewhere in Camino Beach. Can you find it and bring it back here to me? There's nothing more you can tell me? Well, unfortunately, that's all there is. I'll do my best, but uh, I can't guarantee a thing. The cabbie waiting outside drove me back to the gas station on Wilshire where I picked up my own car fresh off the grease rack and headed for the ocean and the sunset. It was getting dark by the time I reached Camino Beach, 
the rickety, salt-cake little town jumbled in between the highway and the surf. Now my first stop was the Tradewinds Cafe, a waterfront shack on spindly legs standing knee-deep in a smelly backwash. It only took ten minutes to find that there was nothing there for me. After that, I drew a blank at each of the three hock shops in town. Wound up an hour and a half later, no farther than the sidewalk curb, where I watched a traffic cop brand my tire with his parking marker, plant a heavy foot on my bumper to steady his bike and light a cigarette. Hiya. Is this your car? Yeah. What is it? Am I overparked? Nope, not yet. Just borrowing your bumper a minute. Fine? Of course not. Got a lot of scratches already. Say, uh, that's a fancy chalk label you put on the side of that tire there. Z, uh, the mark of Zorro, huh? <laughs> no, the mark of Ziegler. That's me. This little thing I worked out to add a personal touch to my business. <laughs> uh, you're a stranger around here, aren't you? Yeah, from L.A. Uh-huh. Saw you coming out of the pawn shop there. You don't look like the type. <laughs> well, I'm not, as long as my luck holds. Actually, a friend of mine lost a wristwatch here in town. I'm trying to locate it. Pretty good watch, is it? Yeah, good enough. The really tough part is that it has a very big sentimental value. I've tried all three of the pawn shops in town, but uh, no dice. You know, if I had a friend who'd lost a good watch, I think I'd check in at uh, Sean's Bicycle Shop on 3rd Street. Well, thanks a lot, Ziegler. Don't mention it. Oh, uh, incidentally, I wouldn't bother to tell him who sent me down if I was you. So long. <laughs> Hello. Hello, anybody there? Hello, Sean? What do you want? I'm closed for the night. I'm uh, interested in a lady's wristwatch, Mr. Sean. Are you now? And just how does that bring you to a bicycle shop? Look, we both know you're a fence, so let's not waste time on that. The what? watch I'm after is platinum set with emeralds and has an inscription on the back. To Margaret from Stanley with eternal love. A bright sentiment, I'm sure. Have you seen the watch? No. Look, Sean. Either I beat your tongue as limber as the St. Bernard's ears, or you accept this $20 in exchange for some straight information. Peacefully. Now take your choice and take it fast. Uh, $20. What kind of a choice is that? But I don't have the watch, Bucko. But you have seen it. Oh, yes. Five, six days ago, a fellow brought that watch in here, wanted to know what it was worth. I said 500 He laughed in my face. Who was this guy? You mentioned something about $20. Oh, yes. Here. Yeah. All right, now give. Oh, that's better. His name is Chip Menashe. In summers, he works in the concessions in the pier. In winters, he's nothing more than a beachcomber. Lives in a little room out on the pier behind the shooting gallery, and that bucko is your $20 worth. It had better be, Shane, or I'll be back for my change. <laughs> The amusement pier was deserted. When I finally found the one-room shack tacked on behind the shooting gallery, it was dark and quiet. I knocked once, got no answer. So I pushed a wad of rags out of a broken pane of glass in the door, reached inside, and unsnapped the lock and went in. With a light from the one naked overhead bulb, I started through the room. On a packing crate that passed for a dresser, I found a week-old newspaper clipping that said the body of one Leon Stice of Camino had been found on an isolated beach Wednesday morning, shot in the chest. No apparent reason. Stice was survived by his wife, Nancy, of 320 Front Street. I got real busy wondering why a bum like Chip Menashe saved old newspaper clippings of murder stories when a noise outside turned me toward the open door. What are you doing in my place? Uh, you weren't home, so I came in to wait. You a cop or something? No, I'm no cop, Menashe. The name's Marlowe. Huh? Uh, maybe we can do business. Sit down. I don't get you. I, uh, collect old watches. Uh. A mutual friend sent me, Menashe. Yeah? I'm interested in ladies' watches, particularly. Maybe something in platinum with emeralds. Okay, Pally, what's the proposition? Uh, nothing until I see the merchandise. Now, how about putting it on display, huh? <laughs> I can't hear you, Pally. Ah, oh, come on now. Where's the watch? Don't rush me, mister. Don't rush me. Get you nowhere else. All right. Uh, make me a proposition. Ten grand? Ten... Ten thousand? Uh-huh. Well, you must be out of your mind. Yeah, we'll see who's out of their minds. That's a very valuable watch. Maybe you better get out of here and add it all up again. Yeah, maybe I'd better at that. But, uh, Menashe, 
don't go away because I'll be back. <laughs> I won't go away. I know when I'm sitting on top of the pile. <laughs> As I walked away, a hunch kept whispering to me that the body of a guy named Leon Stice found on a lonely beach was somehow tied in. So I decided to pay a call on his widow. I drove down Front Street to number 320. But there was nobody home. As a matter of fact, the only sign of life on the entire block was a red neon pelican and a blue neon martini glass above the door of a bar across the street. So I walked over and went in. A couple of questions later, I found Nancy Stice sitting alone in the back. The offer to buy a drink was the only introduction I needed. Sure, you can buy me a drink. Hey, Charlie. Okay, Nancy. I, uh, I'm an old friend of your husband's, Nancy. I just heard. <laughs> that louse didn't have no friends. Here you are, Nancy. Something for you, mister? Uh, no. Um, here, keep Thanks. it. Mud in your eye. Nah, I got nothing against Leon Stice, except 25 years of living with him in a Camino Beach rat hole on nothing. That's all. Any idea why he was killed? For the role he was carrying. After what you just said, that makes no sense. That's the way it was. And I didn't get one red cent of it. It was all gone when they found him. Did you tell the cops he had money on him? Nah. I hate cops. Yeah, sure. Uh, where did Leon get this dough? It's all me. He ran into an old acquaintance who was staking him. Some guy named Martin Vogel who used to live here in Camino Beach years ago. Martin Vogel was staking him? To what? Leon said him and Vogel was going in business together. The cash was in advance. Oh, sure, he was going to be such a big shot. What kind of business, Nancy? Just between... Just between you and me, the only business that crummy mind of his would work on was blackmail. Take it from me. <laughs> and now, how about another drink for his grief-stricken widow, huh? I'll, uh, leave a buck on the bar on my way out. In just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. Now we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Anniversary Gift. I left the Pelican Club, got into my car, and started for the local law on the chance that I could learn something more about the new question mark I'd picked up named Martin Vogel. Ten minutes later, I parked my car under the cracked globe that oozed sick purple light over a weather-beaten sign, Camino Beach Police. A fat sergeant huddled over what could have been the original teletype machine. When I presented my credentials, he jabbed a fat finger at a dirty glass door marked Captain Elvin Bush, Chief of Detectives. Inside, a small old man, neat in a clean white shirt, groomed silver hair and a gentle smile, was strapping on a shoulder holster when I put my license on his desk. When I stopped talking, he got up and extended an almost delicate hand. I certainly hope we can help you, Mr. Marlowe. Martin Vogel, you say? Yes, it might have been a long time ago, Captain, maybe even 25 years, if he was mixed up with the police at all. Uh, do your records go back that far? Oh, yes, by the apple crate load. And I mean that literally, Mr. Marlowe. You see, in Camino Beach, police piles, fixtures, and furniture are somewhat lacking. City appropriations only go where they show. Public bird baths, statues of the mayor. And, oh, here. This bottom crate here. Marked, uh, let's see. Uh, 1921 to 1930. Figure he was arrested along in there, this Vogel? Yeah, if he was arrested. Yeah, it's dusty, isn't it? <laughs> well, <coughs> the cards are alphabetical. Yeah. And let's see, Riker, Rooney, Stemple... By the way, Mr. Marlowe, what's your angle? Yeah, I'm not sure, Captain Svensson, Underley, Utterman, Van... Vogel, Martin. Got it, eh? Yeah, picture and all. Bring it over here in the light. Yeah. 
Uh, Martin Vogel arrested Camino Beach Hotel May 28, 1923 on warrant from Chicago, Illinois Police. Returned to Chicago, sentenced to five years in state penitentiary for embezzlement. Arresting officer, patrolman Elvin Bush. Hmm. Picked him up myself, did I? Well, I've locked up a lot of people in the last 35 years. Yeah, I guess you have it. Holy smokes. Huh? What? That can't be. What is it, Mr. Marlowe? You look kind of pale. There was no mistaking it. The time-yellowed picture of Martin Vogel made it plain. Vogel and my client, the distinguished Mr. Stanley Towner, were one and the same. That meant that Towner had lied to me, and more important, had no doubt killed Leon Stice, who was blackmailing him because he knew he was Vogel. I left Captain Bush, piled into my car, and pointed it back for the amusement pier, where one way or another I was going to get Chip Menashe to fill in a few remaining blanks for me. Marlowe, Menashe. I want to talk business. Okay, Marlowe. Looks like I doped it right. I thought you'd come back. All right. Now get up. Now listen hard. I want the watch and the story that comes with it. I told you my price. It's still ten grand. You're bluffing, Menashe. You know the watch means money, but you don't know why. Yeah, Mr. Wisen. All right, now come on. Talk. Okay, okay, quit. I'll tell you what you want. I took the watch from Leon Stice. I found him dead on the beach. It was clenched in his fist. And the dough you're spending? Was in his wallet. Let me up, will you? All right. Come on. Now sit over there. Hands in your lap. School isn't out yet. What more do you want, Marlowe? How do you tie the watch in with Stanley Towner? What makes you think I did? The fact that I was sent here to Camino Beach and the fact that you were ready and waiting for somebody. Well? Okay, okay. Uh, I was lucky. When I read about Stice in the papers, I also just happened to read another article, an oddity, you might say, about a woman in Beverly Hills, a rich man's wife who got a heart attack in her car just she pulled into her garage. woman called Tana, front name Margaret. Wife of a big shot broker, also called Tana, front name Stanley. I went from there. I was shrewd. Yeah, genius. Okay, now give me the watch. Come on, let's have it. All right, get your mitts off. Here. Now you're real happy, muscles, happy that you... Hey. Cops. Come this way. Hey, Menashe, wait a minute. By the time I got to the door, he was halfway across the boardwalk to his car. But Captain Bush and his sergeant were ready and waiting. When Menashe was next to the gun, he kept in his glove compartment. The spotlight on the squad car slashed through the dark, found him, and froze him in a position. We've got you, Menashe. You'd better quit. Menashe, do you hear me? Yeah. No, you listen, Papa. Let him have it, Becker. The windshield sprang into little pieces. Uh, that got him. Yeah, come on, Becker. Yeah, Captain. I waited until Captain and Becker were next to the body and had lifted it off the steering wheel. Then I moved quietly along the side of the buildings as far as the squad car. There, I turned and started back toward them. Hey! Hey, what happened? Oh, it's you, Captain. What brings you around here, Mr. Marlowe? A guy in town told me that somebody named Chip Menashe might give me a lead on Martin Vogel. You won't be able to now. That's Menashe. What? We wanted him for a week-old stick-up murder. Stick-up murder? Uh, that guy on the beach? The same. Say, Becker, uh, you find the money on him? Right, some 300 bucks, Captain. Good. Well, you better call for the wagon now. Check. Funny thing, Mr. Marlowe, one fingerprint did it. Oh, how's that? And that guy on the beach, Leon Stice, who found his empty wallet in the sand next to him. It had an Eisenglass front over his driver's license with a thumbprint that wasn't his. But was Chip Menashe's, huh? Well, we got on to Menashe because he was spreading a lot of dough around. Today, Becker got down here and lifted one of his prints. That cinched it, huh? Yes, that and the shot he just threw at me. Yeah, strictly a stick-up killer who got caught. Marlowe, about this Martin Vogel, uh, you... Uh, Still want to let it go that the Beverly Hills police are going to get in touch? Uh, I think so. Good night, Captain Bush. The ride back to Beverly Hills was an uncomfortable hour and a half, cold and empty. I was glad that I had things to do like stop and start and shift gears. It kept me from thinking too much about a lot of things and a lot of people I wish I'd never heard of. People like Stanley Towner who I had every reason to be against, but who I was starting to pull for.
Stanley Tarner, a man who would start it all over again after a single mistake made 25 years ago. A man who had fought to build good things, like a comfortable home, a marriage to, to a woman in a painting, a 16-year-old likeness named Catherine. But Stanley Tarner, who was also a killer on a lonely stretch of beach far from home, destroying something rotten who would destroy him, a killer that nobody knew about except me. Well, I pulled into the driveway and parked behind the car that had been Margaret's. As I got out, the light of the garage went on and the side door of the house opened. I felt almost wrong dropping my hand around the thirty-eight in my side pocket. Good evening, Mr. Marlowe. You have the watch? Yeah. I had quite a tussle getting hold of it. I imagined you would. Menashe's dead, Mr. Tarner. Menashe? Who, uh, who is Menashe, Mr. Marlowe? The reason you hired me? The man who called you and dangled this bait... Yeah, you were right. It's a beautiful watch, Mr. Bogle. Bogle? You... you know about it? Yeah, they keep police files a long time. I know about everything. Except why you didn't go after the watch yourself. Well, I, I, I was afraid. Afraid to show yourself in the town where somebody might remember you, huh? The town in which you had committed a murder, is that it? Yes, yes, that's it exactly. Dad? Huh? Dad, is that you down there? Yes, dear. Me, Mr. Marlowe. Well, why don't you come into the house? It's so late and it's chilly. You'll catch your death of cold out there. Yes. In a while, dear. Now go back to bed. <laughs> All right. Good night, Dad. Good night, dear. Well, good night, Mr. Marlowe. And please, make him do as I say, will you? Uh, yes, I, I will, Catherine. Good night. Do you mind if we go along to the police at once, Mr. Marlowe? I'd rather she didn't know right now. Tomorrow is soon enough. And uh, can we take your car? Yeah. The lights go off out here? Yes. The switch is on the garage wall over there. Okay, get in. All right. You know, Mr. Tarner, I'm sorry about Catherine and the way she's going to be hit, but... hit by this thing? The switch is there on your right. On your right, Mr. Marlowe. Uh, yeah. It was a very nice house. Mm-hmm. <coughs> Mr. Tanner, you certainly loved Margaret a lot, didn't you? Completely, Mr. Marlowe. And her memory, too? Why do you ask? Something that makes me awfully happy. Mr. Tanner, you didn't kill Leon Stice. Marlowe, what are you saying? That you never lost your wife's watch at Camino Beach. You never had it. She lost it herself. Lost it when she struggled with Leon Stice just before she killed him for your sake. For you and Catherine and everything you've worked no, for. No, Marlowe, no, yes, you... Yes, Margaret had a bad heart. She knew she didn't have long to live. Also, she knew that Stice was blackmailing you. It figures, Tana. And what also figures is that you'd rather pay for a murder that you didn't commit than to have Margaret's name soiled. Yes, I would. And I will. Because you can't prove any of this. Correction, Mr. Tanner, I can. With your wife's car there in the garage, the car in which she died on what you said was her return from Westwood. Which it was? No. Not according to a funny little chalk mark I just saw on one tire, it wasn't. A little white Z that a policeman named Ziegler in Camino Beach makes to check on parking time. And we can go on from there. Your confession won't mean a thing. But, Marlowe, it will, it will, it must. No. No, I guess it won't. I guess you can't hide the truth very often, can you? No. Only once in a great while. And then, strangely enough, only when it seems like the right thing to do. What do you mean? Why did you stop the motor? There's one thing I haven't told you yet. The way things worked out in Camino Beach, Mr. Tanner. The police there think that Menashe killed Leon Stice, and they're happy that way. They never heard of you or your wife. And I don't see why they should now. Yes. I mean that nobody really knows the whole story. Nobody except you, Marlowe. Nobody, Mr. Tanner. Good night. Thank you, Mr. Marlowe. Good night.
Philip Marlowe will be back in just a moment. Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... This time I was in the country where the night should have been nothing but peace and quiet. But a pair of angry eagles changed all that. One was solid gold and too close to a battered corpse. The other weighed 160 pounds and was too quick with his fists. In or out of the ring. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character. Tonight, starred Bill Conrad, are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald and are written for radio by Robert Mitchell and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Sammy Hill, John Daner, Gene Bates, Ralph Moody, Larry Dobkin, Harry Bartell, and Edgar Berrier. The special music is composed and conducted by Richard Orant. This is Roy Rowan speaking for CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>